Welcome to Searching for the Question Live. My name is David Orban, and I am very happy to have uh, you all uh, following the show. Uh, we are streaming live on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, and you can interact. Uh, your questions and comments are very welcome, and I will be uh, able to uh, bring them on and uh, discuss and comment on them uh, with my guest. Uh, if uh, you enjoy searching uh, for the question live, uh, then uh, I invite you to subscribe uh, uh, to our YouTube channel, uh, but also uh, to join uh, our Discord server. We are uh, continuing the conversation uh, on Discord, uh, talking about the themes of how technology is impacting society and the exponential or even jolting uh, changes that we are seeing uh, around us. And finally, if uh, you like what you see, uh, you are welcome to support uh, this uh, that I produce together with my team on patreon.com slash David Orban. Uh, today's guest is uh, uh, Luca Rossettini. Luca is the founder and CEO of D Orbital Devices. I've known uh, Luca for a long time, many years and uh, space is hard. He has been at it for a long time, but uh, quite recently, um, Luca and his team had uh, breakthrough uh, achievements, real milestones that uh, are worth uh, celebrating. I hope that we will hear not only about what has already been done, but also what his future plans are. A uh, little provocatively, uh, I entitled today's episode Space Trucking for Real. And uh, we will uh, discuss uh, what that means uh, beyond uh, the movie that some of you may have seen, uh, which uh, Luca may or may not uh, resonate with. Um, and uh, space is, is absolutely fascinating. Uh, until recently, uh, we believed uh, it would be only nation states that could play, but today uh, space is uh, a, a new playground for ambitious entrepreneurs and startups that really want to make a difference, conquer the universe. So uh, the Orbital Devices is one of them, and uh, welcome Luca to Searching for the Question Live. Thank you, David. Thank you. And um, uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here with you tonight. Thank you very much. So uh, we have uh, Kaveri from India saying space. Wow. Switching off Netflix and switching to searching for the question live. Thank you, Kaveri. We are honored for you following us. And uh, uh, I hope you will have uh, some uh, questions uh, to ask as well. So, uh, Luca, tell me a little bit, uh, uh, was it in kindergarten that you decided that you want to um, do things uh, with space or, or was it uh, a, a later blossoming of your interest? Uh, it, it actually was in the kindergarten. Uh, uh, I was five years old when I took this important decision that I want to go into space. Uh, you know, I was a young kid, I was with my uncle, my uncle, will explain, uh, he was explaining me how stars uh, uh, work uh, in a very technical and precise way. 
and I didn't understand anything at that time. But, uh, but then I said, okay, so I want to go there and, and see with my own eyes, you know, and, and understand. So since then, uh, since th that time, I planned my life to, well, first to become an astronaut, but, you know, I'm here, so I'm not an astronaut. Uh, and then, like, thanks to the orbit, uh, step by step, um, I'm getting closer and closer. Wonderful. Uh, so um, I, I like to uh, show our viewers um, a little bit of a context, uh, uh, and um, it is pretty appropriate for us uh, to do that, uh, looking at planet Earth uh, from above. So uh, it is one of those rare occasions where both me uh, in the blue place and my guests are close uh, physically uh, because uh, you are near Como, uh, if I am not mistaken, uh, in, uh, in Italy. Uh, Como itself near Lake Como, uh, famous for many things, uh, uh, but uh, also for the um, uh, very romantic scenes of uh, Star Wars uh, being uh, shot uh, in, in those beautiful uh, locations. Um, how come that you didn't decide as many um, to leave uh, Italy, um, but you stayed uh, true to your uh, to your home country and and uh, uh, the orbit is uh, still headquartered in Italy? Well, I, actually, I, I came back to Italy to create the orbit. So I was in um, I was at NASA in Silicon Valley uh, in 29, 2010. And w when I took the decision to create the orbit, I thought it was the right moment. So at NASA, I was working on a on a project about small satellites and the economic feasibility of, of, of the small satellites. Uh, and by the way, my team generated other uh, famous entrepreneurs like uh, Chris Boschwitz and Will Marshall, that actually we were part of the same team. Uh, at that time, I have to, uh, he had to take a decision where to create the company. So US was definitely at that time the best place for entrepreneurs. Uh, but not really for space entrepreneurs. So at that time, there were no investors putting, you know, not even pennies in space. Uh, SpaceX just started at that time. Uh, the, the, there were a lot of debates about uh, investments in the commercial space, and small satellites were just, uh, let's say, toys for universities. Uh, uh, so, and, and plus, I was a non-American citizen. So uh, dealing with the space sector, there is a strategic sector in a country in which you have to go through several, let's say, barriers uh, to get access to, to that domain. Uh, I, I thought, uh, and I, I was right at that time, that uh, going back to Europe, uh, definitely it would have provided less money available for, let's say, investments in a, in a company, but definitely a place to start with. Uh, and on top of that, people. So uh, the, I think, uh, and then, of course, I'm, I'm Italian, so I, I want to spend this for, for, for my country. But I have to say that the flexibility that you can find in, uh, like in, in some countries, even if at lack of, uh, of uh, let's say, uh, deep expertise uh, that you can find after the university, it, it's something that helps uh, to start with the company. So if, if, you don't, if you don't have a lot of money, you need uh, flexible people that, uh, can you know take responsibility of several tasks? So this is the the two situation. So if in US you get more money and you can buy more people and then start amazing companies, but space was very difficult at that time. In Europe, no money but good people, so you can start anyway. And I think you know wherever you are, you find a good environment, a good ecosystem where to create a company. Tell me, uh, what does uh, the orbit do? What was the original mission, and and how is the original mission evolving uh, and becoming more and more ambitious? Yeah, let's say the the the, the, the vision of the orbit is always the same. So we want to uh, um, let's say uh, be the the the, plat the the space transportation platform in orbit. So enable uh, the humankind uh, to operate in space in a sustainable way. This is, uh, this is our vision. How we uh, started, uh, it, it, it is a process. So what, what we decided to do, instead of focusing on technology, because it, it is hard 
to imagine which technology uh, will be available, let's say, in 10 years, we divide our roadmap in markets. And the first market that we identified at that time, so I'm, I'm talking about 2009, 2000, uh, sorry, 2011, when we started, uh, was the, the space debris. So no one was, was working on, on that subject from an industrial point of view. And, and that was the perfect niche to develop a, the first product in which the big players were not involved. So a niche in which the company could grow. Uh, we developed the... The, the first uh, decommissioning system for satellites, so a sort of intelligent motor that you can plug in into satellites that are able to remove satellites at the end of life, even if the satellites are dead. And we develop in a modular way. So all, all of these modules we use to move on and we start building satellites, so small satellites. In, um, so the first launch was in 2013. Then we got a satellite with first customers on board uh, launch in 2017. We tested the business model of using a satellite to, uh, let's say, a satellite for rent. So we ran the satellite to customers in order for them to perform operations on their payload. And now we are getting closer to our vision. I mean, not not so close yet, but, you know, it definitely closer than 2011. We uh, are transporting uh, satellites and payloads in orbit, from orbit to orbit, uh, like the, the last mile delivery, and we are the first company succeeding on that. That's, that's so really let's, let's, yeah. uh, let's uh, um, um, stay on, on uh, the debris uh, first, and then, then we talk about uh, tr the transportation proper. So... Um, while you were talking, I was showing uh, these uh, images of uh, uh, really frightening uh, representation of uh, how much um, junk uh, there is uh, around uh, the planet. And uh, this is expected to obviously increase unless we change the way that we think about uh, space. Uh, and um, we have seen uh, some alerts. Um, so, for example, the International uh, Space Station um, uh, ran the risk uh, of uh, uh, colliding or being hit uh, by um, uh, debris uh, more than once. And when this happens, uh, the astronauts have to retire in one specific module that they expect is going to be the one best uh, protected. And also, just uh, recently, there was uh, uh, an alert uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, can you tell more about what uh, this alert was? And, and at the end, uh, there was no collision, but there were some specific risks. Yeah, uh, at about uh, a thousand kilometer uh, orbit, um... Uh, there were like two pieces of debris, so uh, none of them was under control. So they were just dead, uh, dead piece of satellite uh, and, uh, and launches that they were going to collide. So they were going to pass by each other very, very close. Uh, the, the warning we received was, was telling us uh, 60, uh, like about uh, 60 meters. So in, in space, 60 meters is really nothing. So the, the, the risk was really, really high. And we got a warning because uh, even if this happened at uh, a thousand kilometers, the debris potentially generating from such a, co a collision, they can really spread, you know, everywhere. So uh, some of them will decelerate, so they will reach the lower orbits, but some of them will, will gain so much speed that they can really get higher and higher. Uh, so it, it, it was a dangerous situation. Uh, luckily, nothing happened. But uh, as you said, the situation is getting uh, worse because we are launching so many satellites uh, and that's, that's the situation cannot, let's say, mitigate uh, doing nothing. We need to act. And, and um, even more, uh, there is this concept of a Kessler syndrome, uh, which is uh, a cascade of uh, events, uh, almost like a chain reaction uh, that uh, has been analyzed and, and then popularized uh, 
relatively uh, recently um and uh, then then uh, made uh, very visually uh impactful by uh, the movie uh gravity uh that uh, uh, had some scientific defects uh but um it, let's see if i can find the collision sequence uh video uh be, because uh, uh that was quite um, amazing and and even if uh, there were some uh, defects in the uh, in the uh, uh, representation uh, it was uh, it was really uh, really cool uh, how did you uh, as as a scientist and engineer uh, react uh, uh, to the movie and and the effects of the movie on the industry yeah so uh, actually when the movie uh, uh, was in the theaters we, we we were just at the beginning of our of our company so we we had to realize the first prototype so we got so our website crashed because of the number of visits we were the only one you know like promoting a sustainable use of space uh, but the, what what we thought is Yes, we need to do something, but this is not saving the trees. This is uh, w what we need to do is to save the entire ecosystem because the human being is going, you know, to use it in the future and to live there. So it's not just, uh, let's say, you know, we need to do it because we need to do it. We need to do it because otherwise we won't be able to use space anymore. And this is uh, uh, true for uh, like commercial companies, like for institutions. Uh, and, and that's why we focus on economic advantages associated to the removal of space debris. I think this is an important concept that may help to solve this issue in the near future. Um, Kaveri is asking, how often do we receive uh, these warnings and are they secret so that the public doesn't panic? Uh, no, actually, they, they are not. Uh, they are not secret. So uh, the satellite. So at the moment, we have only two satellites in orbit. Let's say the the, the smaller one. We receive about three to four warnings uh, uh, per year, but it's a very small. And uh, the one that we just launched one month ago, in one month we got one warning. So, so it's, it's not a real statistics, but uh, they say there are uh, uh, several warnings per year. Uh, and the, the, the situation is, uh, is going to improve. Let's say the number of warnings will be higher because we are uh, increasing the monitoring capabilities. So the more radar and telescopes we are going to use and the more powerful uh, technology we are going to use, the number of collisions will also increase. That generate other problems because if you communicate to a satellite operator, let's say 10 times per day, oh look, you, you have a risk of collision, then you know, the satellite operator sooner or later, it will stop you know, worrying about. So we need to improve thanks to artificial intelligence or other techniques the way we communicate the warnings. So warnings are important, but also the way we communicate warnings is, uh, is absolutely important as well. And um, just to illustrate uh, uh, for Kaveri, there is a lot of uh, public information. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, uh, some of it is uh, more um, in, in kind of a popular format uh, so that people can understand. Uh, but uh, the European Space Agency has a lot of open um, uh, science uh, initiatives and the data feeds um, that uh, are uh, available can be used for developing uh, exciting applications. Uh, so uh, Kaveri is uh, saying that uh, she will invest in a hard hat. Um, so yes, one of the applications could be uh, to alert you on your phone when to put on the hot hat because the satellite is arriving. Now, uh, jokes aside, um, the the danger is not that uh, stuff would fall on Earth because even if the orbit decays, uh, all of these pieces of debris are small enough so that they burn up uh, during uh, uh, the atmospheric uh, descent. Uh, you know, they just they are completely destroyed and and uh, we are not in danger 
Uh, but the, 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 the danger is really uh, to everything else uh, that is in orbit, including uh, if a full-blown Kessler syndrome is realized, our ability uh, to launch and, and uh, poke a hole through the cloud uh, of debris. Is that correct, Luca? Yes, yes, David. So let's say so far the risk on on ground it's really negligible, as you said. It's uh, uh, however there are there are two aspects. One is uh, what if we keep launching uh, thousands of satellites? So the the you know we launched about seven thousand satellites in sixty years. We are going to launch fifty thousand satellites in the next ten years. So that that that's that's really. Uh, like an incredible higher amount of satellites. Uh, uh, according to Space Corporation in US, uh, um, the, the risk of collision on ground, once these constellations will be active, will reach 10%. That is, uh, wow, that's, that's a number, right? So, uh, but I don't want to scare people. So we are still far from that, from that event. But as you said, in orbit is even is even worse because uh, these collisions are uh, these co collision risks are increasing. And if one thinks, then who cares about space? You know, I'm, I'm living on Earth, so this is not really impacting me. Even if we destroy the entire sector and we are not able to launch any satellites, who cares? Actually. 80% uh, of the technology that we use on a daily basis uh, is coming from space, agriculture, uh, fintech, uh, uh, even the autonomous driving, uh, industrial sectors, uh, energy, uh, all the sustainability progress that we made on Earth are, are really possible thanks to the use of satellite data. So no satellite data and all these services will, will go away. And who is going to pay more? are the emerging countries that are really dependent on, 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 uh, on satellite services right now. So it's not just, you know, a space geek issue. It's, it's the problem of the entire humankind. So um, your um, approach uh, enables um, dead satellites to be peacefully brought to rest in the atmosphere, to be destroyed rather than uh, lingering as a threat and a zombie uh, uh, in, in, in orbit. Um, and, uh, and there is also a treaty around this, right? So basically, your solutions are compulsory or some competitor solutions. But uh, starting a few years ago, uh, nothing could be uh, put in orbit without something like this taking care of it. Is that correct? So let's say that, that it is compulsory uh, to make sure that satellites at the end of life uh, will be uh, removed from their orbit. Uh, if the satellites are not too far away from Earth, they should be directed towards the atmosphere. At the beginning, the only rule was uh, it should be, let's say, destroyed into the atmospheres in, within 25 years. It's a lot of time. Recently, wow. some nations, not, not, not all, uh, they restricted uh, this possibility and they said if your satellite is big enough that some part of your satellite can, can fall into inhabited areas, then you should go for a direct re-entry. Uh, direct re-entry is a very expensive maneuver. You consume, say, one third or even more of the propellant that you have on board uh, to perform this maneuver, depending on you know how big is your satellite and where and where it is located. So, from a commercial perspective, it's really too expensive. And even institutions, uh, they are not, at least so far, they didn't really uh, comply with this rule, and they asked for waivers. However, this is changing. So the new satellites and institutions are designing are compliant. And uh, let's say our solution, but there are other solutions on the market. Uh, let's say our solution is, is at the moment the only one that allow you to have a direct re-entry. So in 90 minutes, you get rid of the satellites. Uh, at a, a fraction of the cost that you will have if you have to take care of, of, of yourself. But then I, I am looking at the menu, our solutions on your website, and there are only like acronyms, which is the one that I have to pick. The, the D3, the D3, that is uh, the orbit, the commissioning device. <laughs> okay. Yeah, 
it's a, and the, you know the D3 at the moment is just for satellites that need to be launched. Yeah, that's that's a that's a guy. So you you put this guy into the satellite before the satellite uh, is launched, and then at the end of life, even if the satellite is dead, uh, because you don't know when your satellite is going to die. So space is a very difficult environment. You know, suddenly, so the, the one minute before your satellite is sending you a picture. And one minute after, is not responding. So at that point, even if you have propellant on board, you cannot send a command, you know, go away and, and decommission yourself. So this system is capable of understanding when the satellite is having issues. And uh, upon command, uh, is able to remove the satellite from orbit. And if the satellite is, uh, as we said, in the low Earth orbit, it will direct uh, the satellite towards the atmosphere. But if it is far away, uh, for example, in geostationary orbit, it will move the satellite into the graveyard orbit. A graveyard orbit is a sort of wasteland for satellites um, that was created a long time ago. And, and uh, even if, you know, people may think, oh, wow, we have a, a, like a graveyard orbit in space so with a lot of that satellite, but actually this could be an opportunity for the future because you can, you know, in the future, you can go grab that satellites and recycle them and produce new satellites directly in orbit. And, and just to uh, clarify for uh, the people following, uh, LEO stands for Low Earth Orbit and GEO stands for geosynchronous uh, orbit, and uh, low Earth orbits uh, are um, a few hundred kilometers, right? Yeah, yeah. Let's say the, the, the most used orbits are between 400 kilometers, where you find the International Space Station, and let's say 800 kilometers. Most of the small satellites are flying between 500 and 600, exactly because of the regulation you mentioned before. So they cannot go higher, because otherwise they cannot be removed within, within 25 years. And, and uh, geostationary... Uh, orbits are 36,000 kilometers. Yes. So this image is not in scale, actually, uh, because uh, 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 even if we were talking about a thousand, geo is 36 times farther out uh, than uh, than uh, than a thousand kilometers. Uh, and and so the um, uh, the the graveyard uh, that you are talking about is uh, a specific area uh, that has been designated so that we know uh, uh, the, the dead satellites are collected there. Is that, is that right? Yes, yes. So uh, it's a, a little bit, uh, um, let's say, it's a little bit more than 36,000 uh, kilometers. It's outside the geostationary orbit that you showed before. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, here it is. And, and basically, uh, all the uh, geostationary uh, satellites that were out of business, uh, I mean, all, part of them at least, that, that they were still active before running out of fuel, they were moved into that orbit in order not to create any issue uh, to the other live satellites. So we, we, you know, the graveyard orbit is a very specific orbit, so it's divided in slots. Uh, it's it's a unique orbit because the satellite in that uh, in that orbit let's uh, say uh, rotate at, at the same speed of the earth so you have always the satellite on top of your head while the, the the earth is rotating so if you want for example to illuminate so to send signal to europe uh you just need one satellite so that orbit is particularly important and that's why satellite operators uh, of that orbit uh, were the first to uh, adopt uh, the commissioning strategies for their satellites. They could not afford to leave junk uh, close to their operating satellites. Yeah, that's that's a geostationary satellite. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you mentioned that uh, um, the decommissioning the D three uh, product is just one uh, that uh, today you have, and you have uh, other products, other solutions as well for transferring uh, satellites from one orbit uh, to another. So one application is to move a satellite from geo to the graveyard. Uh, 
Uh, what other applications uh, can there be? Why would uh, a satellite operator need to uh, change uh, orbit? And why would they do it uh, with a um, service like yours rather than by their own um, uh, engines? Yes, so let's say that at the moment, this uh, transportation service, uh, last mile delivery, it's, uh, it's uh, focused on transporting satellites. The next step will be also the additional service of retrieving satellites that are already in space. Okay, so uh, uh, that's because the, the, the ecosystem, the commercial ecosystem in space just started. So all the, the, the new satellites that we mentioned before, like 50,000 satellites going to be launched in the next decade, uh, they are all... And, uh, and, and, and forgive me, isn't it correct that 40,000 out of those 50,000 is just Elon Musk? Uh, well, I, sh I should add on top, let's say, the extra 30,000 from Elon Musk. So the, the, there are oh, okay. about 23,000, uh, let's say, commercial satellite plus the initial uh, uh, the initial 20,000, but now they file for uh, more than 40,000 plus yeah. this Amazon as well. Uh, you know, that's the, this number is, the, is keeps increasing. But let's say if we focus on... Uh, uh, if we take away the big players, uh, uh, that definitely they will launch uh, like an enormous amount of satellites. We still have a, a very large number, and those are small satellites. They usually don't have propulsion, so they don't have uh, uh, fuel inside. But even if they have, they need to use the fuel for the specific business that they need to run. So they don't want to use it to change orbit or, or to be removed. So what we do, uh, instead of, um, uh, let's say, waiting for them to reach uh, the position in orbit in which they need to run their business, we do as a sort of delivery track. So we, we go step by step, orbit by orbit, and deliver the satellite exactly where they need to go. Uh, as a let's say future service, this is what we are working now. That it's uh, we, we just have one contract, so we, we the market just started. It's called in orbit servicing. Basically, what you do, you say, okay, you have a satellite in this area, but you may want to serve a different market. So now you know you are serving a specific market, and then you want to change. You cannot. So that satellite uh, uh, cannot be moved. So we can go there, grab it, and move it elsewhere. Or, as we were saying before, your satellite ran out of fuel or have an issue. At that point, you go and grab the satellite and remove it before that satellite will collide with the other satellites of the same satellite operators, disrupting the entire business. So uh, you mentioned a lot of times uh, small satellites. Uh, uh, a few years ago, there was this CubeSat revolution uh, where uh, one liter of volume uh, has been chosen as a useful unit. Uh, and uh, the 10 centimeter per side cube then occupied by, you know, whatever electronics uh, could be fit in uh, the extra space that uh, larger, more spherical satellites basically left over in the in the uh, rockets that would be delivering the the large uh, telecommunications satellites, and and people realized, hey, we could use that extra space and almost zero cost in in launching because you know whatever the weight a kilo weight, uh, it's not that it was free. But compared to the one ton, maybe, of the geo satellite, it was really one thousandth uh, of, of the cost. So when you are talking about small satellites, are you primarily referring to, to CubeSats or there are other format, uh, form factors as well? So let's say today, uh, CubeSats are still the majority of small satellites launched. In particular, the three units. So uh, you mentioned one unit, so one liter. Imagine, let's say, three cubes on top of, 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 of the other. In fact, one of the biggest uh, constellations we have in space that is from Planet Labs, uh, and they used to take images of Earth, they are, uh, it's uh, uh, between 140 and 160 satellites 
all three unit CubeSats. So uh, um, this is still, let's say, the, the, the most used format. However, the size uh, is increasing. So now we have six units. We have 12 unit satellites that are, that are, uh, uh, are going to be built in, uh, in large numbers right now. And my, let's say, my view is that the, uh, so we, we went from very large satellites. As you said, they were cost, the, the cost was hundreds of millions. And now with less than one million, you can, you can really have a satellite launch it. So we went from very large satellites to very small, and now satellites are becoming bigger and bigger, but in a modular way. So the, the, the advanced of uh, CubeSats uh, is now applied uh, to generate modular satellites that will be easy, easy to manage in the future, because uh, if you need to launch, let's say, 100 satellites, uh, you don't need to have a customized satellite for all, for all of them, but you can standardize them. And this help you in the production. This this help you in the allocation of space within launchers. And this also help you in the future if we need to uh, replenish your constellation or even to substitute part of the satellite. Um, so um, we spoke about uh, the, the the transfer and uh, and how the transfer could be for for certain applications or other applications um is is there any uh, relationship or ambition in your uh, plans uh, regarding uh, space based manufacturing where either uh, the the assembly capability or materials themselves you know there's going to be a lot of stuff to move around how uh, are you planning to to participate in that? Yes. So, and uh, I, I like to say to, to to make this example. So we don't build boats on the desert and then move them into the sea, right? But now we are really doing exactly like that. So we are building satellites on Earth and then we need to move them in space. Why don't build satellites directly in space? So I mentioned a couple of times that. The, the giant satellites, uh, 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 they are actually an opportunity. Because imagine if you could retrieve them, recycle them, disassemble them, and reuse the parts to manufacture new satellites directly in orbit, you will save a lot of money. So definitely this is uh, going to happen, and not in 50 years, not even in 20, uh, because uh, there is an economic value doing that. And whoever is going to have a fleet in, 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 in orbit, uh, they will be interested on going after this type of uh, technology. And the orbit, so we, we are having a fleet of cargos uh, and we already started. So we have one in orbit now, one in December and uh, in June another one. So in a uh, in few months, we will have you know, several cargos in orbit. And in the future, it's, a, it's a, an obvious choice uh, to have the fleets manufactured directly in orbit. Um, so if we calculate the total mass uh, of uh, the satellites in the graveyard orbits, uh, that basically becomes a highly refined source of precious uh, 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 materials. And what you are saying is that it is potentially much cheaper to design and deliver robots that can mine uh, that resource rather than uh, bringing new um, materials in orbit, uh, which, which would be more expensive. Is that uh, correct? Yes. So first of all, you save launch costs. Then satellites can be uh, produced as light as possible. So you don't need satellites that withstand the gravity or even the, all the vibration that, that you have, that you suffer when you are launching something. But, but especially, uh, you know, if you develop a good uh, robotic technology, like that's, uh, uh, we are used to do it on Earth anyway, uh, then, of course, initially it will not be cheaper. So as any sector, when you start, you will have to sustain a lot of investments. But then, step by step, uh, it, it will become probably the only viable solutions for satellites, as now it is for boats that we are not building them on the deserts. And there are already tests done in orbit. So we have 3D printers uh, working in space. 
Um, in the 90s, uh, NASA tested a recycling system on the space shuttle. So, you know, uh, probably it's not exactly what we need now. Uh, likely at the beginning, we will not be able to reuse entirely all the materials from satellites. We will need to ship some, let's say, fancy technology from Earth, but it's just a matter of time. Uh, it, it will be a step-by-step -step approach, but this approach is not going to last uh, 50 years. So, uh, you know, the, the space is exponential now. So, and with all the exponential, when we think, oh yes, we didn't do it in 50 years, it will take another 50 years. This is not the case. This, what, what took 50 years in the past is now probably only 10 years far from where we are now. And I, I don't know if I'm finding the right kind of images, but uh, there is an entirely new school of design that will need to be born in order to understand what are the optimal adaptations that uh, our space-born structures uh, will need to um, adopt uh, when they are unshackled from the constraints that you mentioned of gravity, uh, of the, 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 the launch uh, um, uh, forces uh, themselves. Um, and, uh, and it will be fascinating to see how these new kinds of designs uh, evolve. Uh, certainly, uh, with, uh, with the help of human creativity and ingenuity, but I would expect also through generative designs and AI-based uh, approaches that will come up with some crazy solutions. Yes, and, and biomimicry as well, right? So nature is more evolved than, than we are, and we are learning from nature how to design our stuff, so why not in space? What are the most used uh, uh, shapes in space? There's a symmetry and sphere. So, you know, this, this should tell us something. Uh, but definitely we will find like crazy shapes anyway, as, as we are able to do anywhere. And I think the design and the beauty should be part of the space sector as well. Uh, we, we, have, we humans, we, we, we understand that the beauty that I think it's a very important and emotional concept. So we, we need to, to, to use it in every every type of industry and, and, and space as well. So this is also an, an, an aspect that may be worth a, like a, a, a future conversation. Well, um, uh, we, we are getting close to, uh, to the end of uh, our current one and it is worth uh, uh, going a little bit deeper in, in what you just said. So um, your uh, projects uh, uh, are concentrating in helping satellites, helping orbits, helping uh, various uh, initiatives. How do you see, um, if, if any, role in furthering uh, human presence in, in space uh, or, or elsewhere, on the moon or, or, or on Mars? Uh, is the orbit uh, potentially going to, to be able to help in that as well? Yes, definitely. This is, uh, this is our goal. So uh, our goal is really to create the infrastructure that will make uh, colonization possible. So when we talk about co colonization today, we are imagining a, a spaceship going to, to the moon or, or to Mars, deploy people and like some equipment and that's it. But this is not sustainable because then you will need uh, to send food, water and you know, other stuff. And it will, it will be so expensive if you don't have an infrastructure allowing that, that it will not be possible uh, in, in a sustainable way. So it, it, it's the same on Earth. So without logistics infrastructure, there will be no business and activities that will work. So in space will be exactly the same. So our goal is really to become the enablers of this uh, colonization. We want to provide the infrastructure, so that all the transportation systems, but way more than just transportation, all the additional services that, that you will need to make sure that people can live on, on other planets and uh, in space. And this is what we are building, step by step, taking care of the environment, because uh, if we destroy space, no one will go there anymore, forever. Uh, and then making sure that all the satellite operators, you know, can send more and more satellites, provide more service on Earth, and show that space is, a, is really a good environment in which we can build business and in the future also live. And um, so 
there is a photo that you wanted to to share with us. Uh, why don't I bring it uh, uh, on screen, and then you can uh, tell uh, what we are seeing. Oh yeah. So let's say th this is the uh, this is the first picture of the of the cargo that that we took one month ago. But let's show the the next one. Uh, let's see here. Okay, this one. So this is um, uh, it is a low resolution picture because it's coming from a video. But this is a, a, exactly the first, uh, uh, let's say, deployment of, of the first package, if you want, the first passenger uh, uh, in the uh, uh, precise location in which these satellites need to operate. So this is a, 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 an Earth observation satellite. So it, it comes with a telescope inside. These satellites take picture of the Earth. And it needs to operate exactly in this position. Usually, to reach the position, it takes six to ten months. And in our case, after a few weeks, this satellite was ready to operate. Uh, the cargo, you, you don't see the cargo because the cargo is taking the picture. Uh, so this was just uh, ejected from, from the cargo. And this is an example of what we can do now. And on top of that, if I may, David, there's a, uh, another aspect that we are working on together with a lot of young startups and uh, research institutes. Uh, that they cannot afford to build their own satellites to have their technology proven in orbit. Uh, and, and this is important because there are a lot of, you know, good entrepreneurs that they are looking for investors. They have a very good technology and very interesting service that they can deliver, but they need money to do that. And building a satellite, buying a launch, acquiring a frequency license and so on, takes a lot of time, a lot of money. So what we do in our cargo after deploying the satellites, uh, we can also host other type of technology. And we can, let's say, uh, test the technology for these type of companies. And they don't need to pay large amount of money in advance because my cargo mission, so the service, are already paid by other customers. So this is an opportunity that, that we offer to young startups. Of course, if they have good technology, that is useful for the future uh, uh, construction of platform that we mentioned before. Uh, this, this will be very interesting because I will become the adopter of that technology in the future. So, uh, and we are looking for innovative ideas, uh, bright solutions that, that can be deployed in space as soon as possible. So um, according to Crunchbase, uh, from uh, some years ago, uh, when you say you had uh, an issue because nobody would invest uh, in uh, uh, space, um, well, you have made some strides. I don't know if the number is, is correct, but uh, Crunchbase uh, believes that you raised more than 20 million euro in funding. Yeah, let's say that, that now the situation is different, uh, but I have to say that the situation changed in the last, uh, let's say, one year and a half, two years. Uh, in which investors start also putting money in space in a more concrete way. Uh, and this number, if you think about it, is not really big if you think uh, how costly is space. So we raised 21 million so far, uh, uh, plus 15 million from the European Investment Bank uh, that we have just announced. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the way... So we were able to, to build the company even with this, uh, let's say, low amount. I, I know that it's, it looks a lot of money, but for space, it's not really a lot uh, because we decide to uh, use uh, a different strategy. So instead of focusing directly, let's build the first uh, orbital transportation system for everyone. We say, OK, what we need to get there? What is the basic technology that I can sell today? And the data I can use tomorrow to build something bigger and then to sell it again, and then to build something bigger and then to sell it again. So this is the strategy that we are following. That's why in our website, you don't find one product or one service, but you find you know, several, several solutions. And this is, this is also my suggestion to other entrepreneurs. Uh, yeah. Massimo is uh, saying great company. Thank you, Massimo, for uh, the compliments to, to, to Luca. And, and well, these uh, other entrepreneurs uh, will potentially have uh, less of a hard time uh, than, than you uh, because now uh, there is the first uh, uh, venture fund in Italy concentrating on uh, space uh, startups, uh, Primo Space. Uh, 
uh, with uh, a target size of 80 million euro. Uh, once again, may seem a lot of money on one hand. On the other hand, when you look at the billions uh, of budget at NASA and uh, and uh, you know how much money uh, Blue Origin funded by uh, Jeff Bezos is spending and and how much uh, space is is spending. Uh, it let's say let's put it this way it will it will require a lot of smarts uh, to leverage that money uh, in in a lot of uh, cool uh, ideas and uh, in, in initiatives yes the, and, and it is a good starting step right so space is for pioneers today so and even investors uh, are taking a big chance because they don't know the sector, but they see the opportunity. So now space is very attractive for investors because it's uh, it, it's like the pharmaceutical domain. So you invest a lot of money at the beginning, then you need to be patient because it takes some time to get you know to the end. But then the return on investment will be one of the highest in the market. So space is exactly is exactly the same, and investors start understanding that. Of course. Uh, a lot of investors are still very rich people like Elon Musk, as you said, Richard Branson, uh, uh, Jeff Bezos, and so on. But more and more uh, inv private investment funds are investing. And I'm, I'm very proud that uh, Europe has this uh, first uh, uh, only dedicated to space uh, uh, fund. Uh, another one that is worth to mention is Seraphim. They were, let's say, the startup of uh, venture capital uh, for the space investments uh, up to a few years ago. Now they are uh, a worldwide known uh, space dedicated uh, venture capital firm. But let's let's do remember that all these businesses, all these activities, it's really a pioneering activity. And that's, that you need to be brave, you need to, to be resilient and not to give up because in space, you know, whatever you can control, whatever the test you run on ground, when you are in space, then you, you, you are experiencing something that is really, really uh, different. So you, you need to be ready, uh, you know, to, to, uh, to find a lot of issues, but you need to be ready with solutions. And every time you need to have smart people working with you side by side uh, 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 on a daily basis uh, to move forward. So uh, Kaveri uh, says uh, in India, uh, we have Bangalore, which is a space tech capital, and there could be a lot of partnership opportunities. Definitely. That's that's an amazing uh, comment. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, as we said, in, in, uh, in the new space domain, uh, there are several companies but we are not really, uh, uh, we don't feel each other as competitors and we tend to cooperate and work together. This should be done also on Earth. So if we understand that space is the next domain uh, in which we are going to live and do business, let's join together, uh, put on the table more ideas and sooner or later someone will you know, put a penny on them and, this, and they will become real. Uh, there are uh, companies that are using the crowdfunding to raise some money to start. There are other services that you can use, institutions that are helping young entrepreneurs to start their, their careers. As I said before, uh, I can help some young companies to, to have their technology flight proven in a few months rather than in years. And uh, I think if we all help each other, so of course, you, you need to run a business, you need to make money, you need to pay the salaries at the end of the month. But if we are able to cooperate all together at the worldwide level, no boundaries, no nation colors, who cares? From space, we are all one planet. This is really make a difference. Wonderful. So, Luca, thank you very much for being with us uh, today. Congratulations on your past uh, 10 years and good luck for the next uh, 10 years. Uh, there will be a lot of uh, exciting uh, projects and uh, developments. And uh, thank you for uh, being on Searching for the Question Live. Thank you. Thank you, David. It was an amazing experience. Um, I'm really grateful to have the, the chance to be here with you. And thanks also for, the, for all the people and all the comments, even all the comments that we didn't have time to, to read. So thank you very much. Wonderful. Uh, so, uh, everyone, thank you very much for following uh, Searching uh, for the Question live. Uh, 
as soon as we are done with the broadcast, uh, uh, the the live stream, I should say, uh, you will be able to to watch and share uh, the video on on YouTube or Facebook, and uh, feel free to to send it to your to your friends. And uh, uh, as I said before, uh, if uh, you want to sign up uh, and uh, uh, subscribe uh, to the YouTube channel uh, or to our Discord server. Uh, we also have actually uh, an Italian YouTube channel. Uh, you can find it most easily uh, by typing davidorban.com slash YouTube Italiano. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, if you, you feel that uh, this content is uh, valuable, uh, you can become a fan, uh, a supporter, a sponsor, or a benefactor on uh, uh, patreon.com slash davidorban. Thank you again and uh, see you at the next uh, episode of uh, Searching for the Question Live.